Support for this podcast is provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is committed to preserving and expanding educational opportunity for today's students, now more than ever. Welcome to The Key with IHE. I'm Paul Fain, a news editor at Inside Higher Ed and the host of this podcast, which looks at the uncertainty facing colleges and students amid the pandemic. Few issues feature more uncertainty for college leaders these days than figuring out what to do for the fall semester. Will students return to campus? Will classes remain online? And how do you plan when you don't know the answer to these questions? While this is a challenge for all colleges and universities, community colleges had tight budgets before the crisis began, and they serve the nation's most vulnerable students. To get some insight into the decisions community college leaders are wrestling with right now, I spoke with Stephen Johnson, president of Sinclair Community College, which enrolls 18,000 students in my hometown of Dayton, Ohio, which was hit hard by the last recession. What you see as, well, okay, here we go. We know how to roll our, our sleeves and we're going to roll up our sleeves and do what we need to do to get through this. And it's not just survive, but how do we recast that which we are so that we are thriving when we get on the other side of this? Dr. Johnson and I talked about budget planning and the enrollment outlook for the college this summer and this fall as well as how Sinclair is preparing to help students get labor market returns and an economic recovery we most certainly have yet to begin. Now on to the conversation. Paul, how are you today, sir? Thank you so much. Uh, really good to hear from you. As you know, I'm, I'm pretty biased here, big fan of Sinclair and Dayton, but uh, wanted to get your thoughts of what I know has been a, a pretty hectic, busy time. You mentioned that your your planning horizon has changed. Can you talk about the time frame that you're looking at now? Paul, one of the things that we're doing at Sinclair Community College is trying to plan on multiple, within multiple time horizons. First of all, we're trying to plan our next fiscal year operating budget, which of course begins on July 1 uh, for us in the state of Ohio, and maybe most of the nation is on that fiscal year. So we're trying to build the operating budget and the capital budget for uh, the coming fiscal year. But we're also assuming that because there are so many unknowns in state subsidy funding and in enrollment and in local real estate levy tax uh, receipts, there's so many unknowns that we are probably going to plan to do budget adjustments as needed throughout the year. We don't want to overshoot. We don't want to, uh, we want to be measured and we want to uh, build a realistic budget that, uh, but we don't want to do too much uh, and cut too much or restrain too much and uh, otherwise hurt our operations. So we're going to probably be more measured. So normally, Paul, we would set the operating budget and take a look at it in, in January for any kind of small marginal adjustments, um, but it would be pretty much set for the year. I'm thinking that the planning horizon will be such that we'll probably be looking at this three or four times through the year and making adjustments. That makes sense. And your your offerings this summer will be online only, but how do you prepare for when and if you're able to to be to resume in person? So here at Sinclair, we're finishing up the spring term and uh, we're finishing some 18,000 students through their program of study. And we'll have a record year, record number of graduates and in, in, uh, overall and in a number of important categories. And now we've begun enrollment in summer for summer term and uh, enrollment is down significantly at this point in time i don't think that will be the case long term i think we will be experiencing a surge of enrollment either later the summer or into the fall but at this point in time we are planning to open our fall or excuse me our summer classes on may 11th at a distance so we'll be at a distance only for the first part of summer, but we are prepared to start face-to-face -face or phase in face-to-face -face as, as possible, when possible, uh, during the summer. And I think, I think we have a significant number of students who want face-to-face, -face, and when we're able to go back to face-to-face, -to -face, at least to some degree, it might not be you know, five days a week or three days a week. It might be just one day. It might be more blended, like, okay, come to class one day a week face-to-face -face, and the other two class sessions will be uh, via, you know, video chat or something. So we'll probably be more blended, but I think that the students will appreciate being back face-to-face -face and our enrollment will probably surge. But for the spring, 
the students are sticking with you. They are sticking with us. We, we actually have 18,000 students. Uh, we, we actually have a, a, few, a few more than we expected. When we cut over to all online and at a distance, and we made, made that cut over in mid-March, when we cut over and began at a distance only on March 23rd, we thought we were going to have, you know, a few thousand just completely drop. They didn't. They stuck with us. So they are, they're sticking with us, and they're finishing out their, their, their programs of study and finishing out the term. But we're getting indications that they're probably 25 to 30 percent don't really like online. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're going to probably sit out subsequent terms until they can go face to face. And I know Sinclair does a lot in, in prison education as well. And it sounds like you've been able to keep those going. Paul, in addition to our traditional on-campus education, we have a, a pretty robust prison education program. We call it our advanced job training program because every single student that is incarcerated in the state prisons are in a uh, certificate or degree program. And so they're not just taking random classes, they have to commit to a program. And it's going very well. We have uh, 1,400 students now enrolled and we're keeping them going too uh, through their program of study, even though they cannot study uh, online uh, because prison students don't have access to online. It's not allowed within the prison system at this point in time. So we're, we've gone old school. We've made uh, hard copy packets for every student and we deliver packets with assignments and and materials to all 1,400 across about 16 different institutions. And um, we pick them up the next week and give them a new packet. And so and the, and the faculty are grading and doing that work from a distance. So it's, it's working. Not, it's not great, but it's working, and the students are making progress. We're going to take a quick break. Please stay with us. Does Inside Higher Ed's wide-ranging coronavirus coverage help you stay informed? Show your support by becoming an insider, our membership program, and enjoy special benefits and offers. Your support helps us continue our journalism and free access to all of our daily news and opinions. To learn more and join, please visit www.insidehighered.com backslash membership. In, in Washington, we're talking about yet another stimulus. A lot of questions about how you, you do job stimulation and make sure that it's for jobs that are going to be there on the other side. And obviously, community colleges are on the front lines of this. You know, I wonder, in, in kind of loose terms, what you would like to see as being the sort of jobs that a stimulus bill would focus on if there was a jobs bill. Paul, I, I think that the federal stimulus is really important. I think it's really important in the short run. And I, I think we need to always remember there's that's not truly free money. And uh, any money that they have to, quote, print, you know, needs to be paid back someday, sometime. But in the short run, during this economic crisis, I think it is the right and proper thing to do to provide stimulus funding uh, by whatever means that they are doing it. And we need to focus that money into productive sources. It can't just be spread around society willy-nilly. It needs to really be focused. And I, and I think the intention is there to do that. And I think it is probably happening in a pretty thoughtful way. And it needs to continue to be focused. A part of it needs to be focused on workforce education. With the baby boomers retiring in droves as they are, and they're going to continue to move out of the workforce, we're going to have shortages of everybody, whether it's healthcare or skilled trades or in, in supply chain and what, whatever supply chain you would talk about, uh, agricultural, food supply chain, or manufactured goods supply chain, um, just, just shortage of everybody. And so we need to continue to skill and reskill our, our, our friends, our, our family, our neighbors, our citizens. Um, and so stimulus money can help do that. The community colleges across the nation have capacity. We don't need to build buildings uh, for the most part. 95% of us, we have capacity. We need the incentives for the students. We need, the, uh, we need that stimulus to help students get into class, uh, get into training, get into certificate programs, get into degree programs, and get into the workforce. And if they're already in the workforce, get re retrained and recertified in other areas as needed. 
obviously uh, the last recession hit Dayton and Ohio quite hard. And I wondered how that experience, the lessons learned, the attitude that you bring to bear having been through that is, is impacting how you're take, taking on this new challenge. So Paul, you, as, as you know, Dayton, Ohio is uh, a mid-sized city uh, located in the, the, the east of the Midwest. And Sinclair is located, headquartered in, right in downtown Dayton. And uh, our region is about a million people here in, in the Dayton region. And, and if you add Cincinnati, which is about an hour south of us, we're two, three million people. Columbus is about an hour and 15 minutes to the east of us, another two million people or so. It's a nice part of the country. It's a nice region. And uh, there's a lot going on here. The people here have experienced economic decline numerous times in the last several decades. And um, no one wants to be good at it, <laughs> but if anyone, if any, if any community, uh, a group of people are seasoned when it comes to managing economic decline and turning things around, Daytonians are, are good at it. And so I, I, I think that you don't see panic and fear as much as you might see elsewhere, what you see as, well, okay, here we go. We know how to roll our, our sleeves and we're going to roll up our sleeves and do what we need to do to get through this. And it's not just survive, but how do we recast that which we are so that we are thriving when we get on the other side of this? Well, uh, looking forward to seeing you on the other side in person as well. And I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you so much. Thanks. And a shout out to all the journalists who across the nation who are doing uh, yeoman's work to report and to keep us informed and to, um, because it's really important because good information is really important in these times. And so thank you. And uh, thanks to all the journalists who are, are working really hard to uh, provide the services they're providing to all of us. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate that. Keep, the, keep us in the loop. That's how we do it. Thanks. That's it for this episode of The Key with IHE. Next time I'll be speaking with Paul LeBlanc, president of Southern New Hampshire University, one of the nation's largest, which has quite a bit of change in store next fall and the next year for its campus-based programs, including The Price. Catch you then. Support for this podcast is provided by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is committed to preserving and expanding educational opportunity for today's students, now more than ever.